Hi, everybody. My name is Gary Cranston. Um, I want to welcome everyone here to this online program of the American Writers Museum. We are pleased you are all able to be here with us this afternoon, and we'll give everyone a minute to kind of file into the room and find their seat, so to speak. As I said, my name is Carrie Cranston. I'm the president of the American Writers Museum, where I'm sitting here today. And just a few short housekeeping things before we get going with today's program. First off, I want to thank the Executives Club of Chicago for helping us promote this event to their members, and we are grateful to any who are attending today. Um, next, I uh, just kind of wanted to mention some of the things that we have going on. Um, you can check out our YouTube channel um, uh, at any point. It's full of videos of current programming and past programming. Uh, this program will go up there in a couple of, of days after this event. And uh, if you like what you see there, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find it at youtube.com slash American Writers Museum. Um, you can also order today's book directly um, from the Conant Leadership Academy um, if you don't have a copy already. Um, the book we're talking about is The Blueprint, uh, which I have a copy of right here. So if you get a chance, order the book. I will put that in the chat in just a minute. Um, if you like the kind of online programs you've been seeing from us in the past several months, you can become a member and get advance notice of special programs and offers, as well as open access to the museum and much more. As you're watching this conversation, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you look down at the bottom of the Zoom uh, window, there's a button that says Q&A. If you have a question you want us to ask the authors today, just type it in there. Um, we're going to do the interview, and then in, toward the end, we'll take as many questions as we can fit in from the audience. Uh, and uh, we want to say we're grateful to all of you for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. We hope to see you all in person when we reopen the museum to the public on May 14th or one day thereafter. We're looking forward to being open again. Um, we have two very special guests today, the co-authors of the book, The Blueprint, Douglas R. Conant and Amy Fetterman. Doug Conant is an internationally renowned business leader, New York Times bestselling author, keynote speaker, and social media influencer with more than 40 years of leadership experience at world-class global companies. Doug has served in C-suite roles as president of the Nabisco Foods, CEO of Campbell Soup, and as chairman of Avon Products. In 2011, he founded Conant Leadership, a mission-driven community of leaders and learners who are championing leadership that works in the 21st century. Amy Fetterman is a highly experienced writer, fastidious editor, passionate marketer, and voracious reader, and a social media infatuate. She has worked with Doug and the Conant Leadership Academy for nearly eight years and has a long career in communications, writing, and digital marketing. And finally, our moderator today is another CEO with a long history of leadership. John is Esty is currently chairman of SNC Electric, uh, headquartered in Chicago. John has held a number of responsible positions at SNC Electric since 1972, including president and CEO. He's also served in leadership positions in the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and the National Electrical Manufacturers Association. From a nonprofit perspective, John is a past member and chairman of the Adler uh, Planetarium here in Chicago and uh, is director is a director of the Shelter for Abused Women and Children in Naples, Florida. And most importantly for us, he is our current chair and a strong supporter of the American Writers Museum. At this point, I'm going to hand the program over to John and Doug and Amy. Um, and as I said, I'm going to be putting the link to the book, The Blueprint, into our chat. So give me just a second to invite our guests to join us. Um, I'm going to bring up John Esty, Doug Conant, and Amy Fetterman. And I'm going to hand this over to John. Thank you, Kerry, and thank to all who have joined us today. You know, one of the uh, one of the advantages uh, of Zoom is that we're able now to have audiences much bigger than we could when we, in the pre-pandemic days, had these events in person in the museum. So it's a great feature. We now have people from all over the country and outside the country. So thanks to all of you for joining us. You can be assured that we will continue this practice once the pandemic is in the rearview mirror. And one of the reasons we have such a large audience today are the stars of our show. Doug, it is a real privilege to have someone as accomplished and knowledgeable as you with us today. So thanks so much for being with us. And Amy, we are thrilled to have such a skilled author with us and we're very much looking forward to learning from you about how people collaborate in creating a book like The Blueprint. Now, I know some have read the book and some have not yet read the book. So I'd like to start, Doug, with a bit of a level setter so people can get to know you a little better. 
as Carrie said, you've had an incredibly successful career, but maybe you could talk about you know, something that happened early in your career when you got really unexpected bad news and how that was so formative and how that uh, sort of helped in the crafting of the uh, Blueprint book. Uh, sure, John, uh, and thank you for having us. Uh, and, and speaking of Amy Fetterman, I know we'll get to her, but I learn from her every day. She's an extraordinary contributor to this process and I'm thrilled that she can be part of the program. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, I uh, was working in Boston, uh, on the North Shore of Boston. I went into work one day after I had, uh, my wife and I had moved there. We had just had our second son. We were living in Old Town Marblehead, living right on the seashore, the birthplace of the American Navy. My family had been the found, it was the founding family of Salem, Massachusetts, right next door. It was all meant to be. And then I went into work one day at Parker Brothers Toys and Games, where I was director of marketing, and the receptionist sent me upstairs to talk to the senior vice president. And I had been working for this company and its parent company for almost 10 years. And the senior vice president said to me, Doug, your job has been eliminated. You need to be out of here by noon. I wish you luck. And then I had to leave. I... I my career was over in a snap. Uh, it was overwhelming. I had been working for about 10 years for this company. I had worked hard. I had done everything I felt that had been asked. But when I look back on it now, I hadn't done as much as I could have. And that was the lesson I learned from it. But I went home to my wife, my two small children, and my one very large mortgage, uh, feeling every bit the victim. Ultimately, I went through an outplacement process with an extraordinary outplacement person who started me focusing forward, not living in the rearview mirror of what could have been and what could I have done differently, but I needed to get a job and I needed to get back on my career track. So that's what started me out on this journey of trying to find my way. You know, there's a wonderful quote from Brene Brown, and we're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing a podcast with her in a couple of weeks. And she, every year I pick a favorite quote. And this past year, my favorite quote was from Brene. And, and this quote is, you can either walk inside your story and own it, or you can stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness every day. And basically through my career up to that point in time, I was an oldest child. I was walking in my parents' story for me, my teacher's story for me, my coach's stories for me and then my boss's stories for me, but I wasn't walking inside my story. And I began to learn that I certainly had to pay attention to the world around me, but I had to be much more well anchored in terms of my convictions and the things I believed in. And that's what started me on this journey 40 years ago now, uh, almost 38 years ago. And, uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm, just about, I'm, I'm just about midway, I'm, I, I'm starting to get it. You know, I'll turn 70 in a couple of weeks and I'm, I'm getting close. So that's the background there. And that's why I think this book right now is, is so essential for people in such an unsettling time. So you reached youthful middle age. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so what, what actually called you to, to write, this, write this book? I mean, you've well, lived, you've lived uh, your leadership career, but what, why this book? Well, this book, I think it was essential when we wrote it. And, and we, we launched it on March 5th of last year, right into the teeth of the pandemic. We started canceling the launch events on March 6th and uh, we're living the relaunch right now. But we wrote it because uh, one of my mentors, a guy by the name of Warren Bennis coined the phrase in 1987 that we were living in a VUCA world, V-U-C-A, VUCA. And it's volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. People should Google it. It's really a fascinating. And in 1987, he was saying it was a VUCA world. Today, it's a VUCA world on steroids. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, increasingly so and ambiguous. And people are getting overwhelmed by it. And they're being buffeted by all the storms and the winds coming at them. And what we're observing is they don't have their rudder in the water uh, in terms of what they believe. 
You know, Maya Angelou has a great quote. She talks about courage and she says, you know, courage is the most important trait because with, without courage, you can't practice any other trait with consistency. You can't have the courage of your convictions. And what I was discovering in my work life was people hadn't done enough work to know what their convictions were. So it was hard to have courage. And we're trying to help people reflect on their convictions, learn from the world around them, b- build an approach that works for them and gives them a little more confidence when they go through the trials and tribulations of everyday life, which is, it's overwhelming, right? It's a cockamamie life. Nobody has time to do anything. And so we, our goal was to help them get, build a strong foundation. Amy will talk about this build a strong foundation so that they could deal with the winds of change that were coming in their lives. So that's why we wrote it. Uh, And uh, I must, I must say, I continue to, I teach this work now and the people that go through our programming are becoming so much better anchored in what they believe in and how they want to impact the world in a way that honors the expectations the world has of them. So uh, it's been a very fulfilling, uh, chapter here for me. So Doug and Amy, who are you writing for? Are you writing for, you know, beginning in their career, mid-career, out of work, uh, frustrated, uh, late career, all of the above? Who would get the most out of this book? I'll start, but then Amy would be a strong finish. We're writing for all aspiring leaders. You know, if you, and I know you've been through the book, John. Uh, This book would have worked for me as a father, it would have worked if I was a teacher or a superintendent of a school, or if I worked in a civic organization or a nonprofit organization, it would have worked. My experience largely captured in this book, although it's not exclusive, is in the corporate world, but aspiring leaders in all walks of life who hunger to do better and are finding it, they're just stuck. They're just stuck. They're overwhelmed and they're stuck. And we, our goal is to help them get unstuck. And uh, but all aspiring leaders and Amy, bring it home. <laughs> well, he, thanks, Doug. And the you asked Doug about his story of getting fired, and the book opens with this devastating story. And the reason we anchored a book uh, written by somebody as accomplished and experienced chairman CEO like Doug in this moment of vulnerability is because we wanted the process to be so approachable for anyone. You don't have to have already uh, climbed the ladder. You don't have to be a CEO to get something out of this process. Uh, You just have to start. We have an Arthur Ashe quote that we use a lot, which I think is, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And that's very much the spirit of the blueprint process. So somebody who is a chairman CEO like Doug can get something out of it, but somebody who's just lost in the muck of this, as Doug would say, cockamamie life can also just start where they are and do what they can. And this gives them a process to get started. Amy, while you're talking about that, speaking of process, how do two people write a book? Uh, Because you're not always in the same location. Uh, You obviously go at things a little bit differently. You're, You're a very experienced writer. Doug has a lot of great ideas. How do you put it all together? Well, in in our case, um, I had the benefit of, I think the most important thing for a collaboration is trust. And I'd had the benefit of already working for Doug as a content creator, writer, and communicator for years prior to him engaging me to write this book with him. So we'd already been disseminating this leadership message to a broad audience. We'd already been collaborating that way for years, which created a strong foundation, if you will, to allow us to um, write this book together. And you also just have to be in constant communication. Uh, you know, we, we wrote this book in a very 2020 way in 2019. We were just on phone calls, sending each other pages back and forth, which is kind of the way everyone's learned to collaborate now. Everyone's on Zoom, people are working from their homes. Doug, we were trailblazers. We, we were writing the book this way, not sharing physical space uh, for, all of, for a lot of 2019. Um, and I think one of the most important things uh, for a collaboration like this, if you are a novelist and it's just your vision, you can just sit down in the chair and write. For us, we had to have a lot of discipline and organization. We have a quote from Stephen Covey that was one of Doug's greatest influences and mentors. And he says, begin with the end in mind. So one of the most important processes for writing this book together 
was before we even wrote the book was we had a book proposal. And that's your way of thinking through an outline and being really organized. So before you even say it, you know what you're going to say before you say it. And of course, along the journey, along the writing process, you're going to uncover insights and stories that you hadn't thought of in the book proposal. But to have this document that keeps you organized and then you have deadlines that you adhere to for us with near militants, I would say, wouldn't you, Doug? Yeah. Where Because we're writing and we're editing at the same time. I'm sending Doug pages, he's editing them. And while he's editing them, I'm writing the next crop. And then you build in a buffer so that when I get those edits back, I'm working on those, but we haven't lost any ground on the timeline. We're still moving forward. So uh, it was a a very organized process. And uh, I think that helped a lot. What do you think, Doug? Uh, I do. And I I think uh, I agree with you. Um, uh, Probably the most important piece of this was that uh, Amy and I had worked together. And so before we started, she can finish my sentences in the leadership space. And, and, And I might say something and then she would say to me, well, don't you really mean this? And she was right. Uh, And so uh, having worked together, doing social media work and, and articles and uh, social media in particular, where you're, iterating, iterating, iterating every day and sharpening your messaging in nice tight pieces, uh, we became pretty fluent at talking the concepts here. So that was probably the single biggest uh, thing uh, that worked for us. Uh, The other piece that I I, I love, and we talk about this in the book up front, is look, I'm a 70 year old guy or will be in a couple of weeks. I, my work experience, John, and I bet it's similar to yours and people of our vintage, if you will. Uh, I had 28 bosses. Uh, 27 of them were men. 26 of them were white men. And they had bosses. And all of those bosses were white men. And so in my work experience, of people I worked for, my leadership, the people that led me, I, you know, uh, 50, uh, 55 out of 56 people were men, you know, and here I'm trying to bring the written word and the spirit of what I've learned to an audience that's just much more diverse and much richer and has a different view of the world. And I, I pride myself on staying current and trying to be in touch. But if I had written this book by myself, it wouldn't be nearly as good as it is with Amy's influence, because she's viewing it through the eyes of a gifted writer who's 30 something, you know, so you take the 30 something writer, and and the old white male, you put it together. And this is a place where I think you can really celebrate diversity of thought and diversity of expression. And that's what I loved about it. It's just so much better than I could have ever done uh, without Amy. Did you have your interesting thought, Amy, on that score, a lot of people tune into these to sort of learn about the writing process. And so maybe just to finish this, this this subject, uh, what best practices uh, do you have that people could bring to their writing craft? Uh, yes. And thank you, Doug, for those kind words. I, I appreciate it very much. And I, um, before I answer your question, I just want to mention that it is really important in a collaboration to have somebody like Doug who values the role of the writer, not just as putting words on paper, but as a critical thinking partner, you're both pushing the thinking together. And that's really important if you want a collaboration for a book like this to write, because something that stuck out to me as we were writing the book is Doug. Doug says, we define it this way in the book, leadership is the art and science of influencing people in a specific direction. This doesn't have to occur in a hierarchical space. It can be up, down, or sideways. But thinking about what the goal of writing together is this quest for clarity, and you're really looking as a writer to persuade and to delight and to explain, and these are all tools of influence. And as I was thinking what I'm bringing to the process, writing this book about leadership, it really became kind of this aha moment for me that writing is leadership. And I I think the audience here might appreciate this today because we have leaders and writers on the call with us, that you are, as a writer, you are leading the reader. 
And that's really important. And it's, a, it's important to engage with that responsibility um, thoughtfully. Um, that said, some tools for writers. One of the most important, I think that every writer needs to hear, myself included, and this is actually a rallying cry in the book, The Blueprint. We tell people to forget perfection. Now, writers are all afflicted with this malady of writer's block, and it comes from this crushing anxiety of not getting it just right. And there's a, there's a quote from Nora Roberts. She says, you know, I can fix a bad page. I can't fix a blank page. And this is something that I have to hear over and over again. You have to find a way to just do it. And there is this crush of writing advice. And a lot of it gets really similar. It's you have to sit in the chair every day. Um, no matter what, even if your house is on fire and your dog's biting you, you have to sit in that writer's chair every day. And I think that um, loses some of the nuance because, you know, we can't all be Stephen King. We can't all have this superhuman innate desire and discipline to spend every waking moment writing. So I think if we wanna forget perfection and we wanna just get it done, we have to do a little reflection to figure out what motivates us. And this is actually parallel to the blueprint process. Um, but for me, I realized for better or worse, I don't mind letting myself down, which isn't great, but it's just the truth. But I can't stand to let somebody else down. So for me as a writer, it's creating tension in my life and engineering accountability from external stakeholders so that I get what needs to be done, done. In the case with Doug, we had deadlines. We had a publisher who was looking for us to meet deadlines. I have my boss, Doug. So that is a natural fit for me to create that time pressure, those deadlines. But if, if you're somebody who doesn't have to answer to anyone and you just wanna get writing done, um, you can engineer accountability in other ways. I say to declare yourself which is another Dougism. Doug declares himself as a leader. I say, declare yourself, tell everyone you're working on a project. Tell everyone you know in your life, I'm a writer and I'm working on X. And ultimately these people are gonna come back and ask you, how's, how's this project going? What's going on with that project you told everyone about? So you can find ways to engineer kind of um, people to not nag you, but to have that accountability if you're motivated externally like me. So find what works for you and forget perfection and find a way to get it done. <laughs> Good advice. Uh, you laugh. I'm writing the family story of our, uh, our family and Doug, my seventh great grandmother was killed in the Salem witch trial. So you're going to have that city in common. Um, I wanted to shift to you in the book, talk about um, other books on leadership. Uh, and you quote some really uh, uh, terrific uh, thinkers in the field of leadership. And Lord knows there's been a lot of books about leadership written. What makes the blueprint uh, different? What, what, what's your unique angle or what, what helped you bring people that they wouldn't find in, in all the other leadership books they can find in the library or at the bookstore? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. It is unique and I'll tell you why. Uh, the only book that I'm, uh, that I'm familiar with that is sort of cut from the same cloth is Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where he shares principles for how to be effective with you, but then he has you take your own journey through it and, and, and actually write your own personal mission statement and figure out how you wanna walk in the world and learning these principles. Uh, the blueprint is not about me, it's all about you. And it's about helping you uncover a foundation that speaks uniquely well to you. And uh, most of the leadership books are books written by either people who've never done it, but studied it. And they add, they add value because they have a detached third party perspective, which I think is important to have. But it's ins I would argue it's insufficient because anybody who's working in there and carrying the load every day, 365 days a year, and has to show up and deal with the same people the next week, and the next week and the next week will tell you, uh, those books are maybe useful, but they won't help me get my job done. Uh, and, then, and then there are some other books uh, that are written by iconic leaders who said, here are the five things I did and you ought to do these five things, but they're about that leader, they're not about you. So the blueprint is designed to help you build your own foundation identify, reflect on your life, study the world around you in a way that works for you and build your own leadership philosophy. 
And, uh, and that can be done. And the other important thing about this book is it's, it's done with a recognition that you have a cockamamie life and you have no time to do any of this. So we built it in a bite-sized way, studying uh, the evolution of habits. James Clear, who wrote Atomic Habits is the latest habit person. And, uh, and we've studied how to find habits that can work for you in a busy life. And we've engineered that approach into this book so that you can start to build your own leadership model, your own leadership philosophy in bite-sized bites, forget perfection. But as you know, John, the key to success is continuous improvement. And it's about doing a little better tomorrow than you did today. And if you do a little better tomorrow every day, you ultimately find out the better is best. And it's about continuous improvement. So we built something that can be approached in Amy and I run a, we do a two day boot camp, and we can get people started on this. And they build their own leadership model. And then the last thing I'd say is they build this model, we help them bring it to life with habits and practices that they can do on Monday morning. And then we help them think through, okay, this has been great. I've been in la la land for two days with you, Doug. Now I've got to go back to the real world. And we help them build their reentry plan. Okay, how are you going to take this back into the world of work and sustain the effort in a practical way so that you can look back on this 30 days later and say, you know, it really made a difference. So it's a blend of, of, of the craft of teaching leadership, but also with a very pragmatic lens. Uh, and that's what I think is, uh, is unusual as well as it's all focused on the individual. So I found the structure interesting. Uh, for those who've not read it, it goes through six steps of the building your foundation, sort of the, the blueprint part. And it's, it's, there's a lot of introspection, a lot of work required to get that done, a lot of thought required to get that done. And then you have sort of your um, management or your leadership manifesto. Yeah. And it struck me a little bit like those are the answers to the quiz they were just taking. <laughs> and I'm curious about how it got structured that way so that you, you, oh. you make them do all the, the, uh, all the, the introspection, all the thinking. And then you give the reader a lot of really, really useful, practical uh, advice on ways to approach leadership. How did you end up structuring it that way? Well, oh, very intentionally, and Amy can comment on this, but... Uh... You know, the most important thing, those 10 in the leadership manifesto in the back half of the book, those are my 10 things that were important to me. But the whole premise of this book is it's not about what's important to me. It's about you sorting through what's important for you. And so what we encourage people to do is the first time through uh, building their own leadership model and, and crafting their own leadership approach. They shouldn't be reading about my 10 things. They should be reflecting on what are the things that really speak to them in a deep, deep way. You know, uh, my, one of my mentors, Warren Bennis, had this great quote. You know, he said, becoming a leader is synonymous with becoming yourself. It's precisely that simple, and it is also that difficult. So as people explore themselves and try and land on the courage of their convictions, that's what's most important about the blueprint. And then I share with them mine. And then we encourage them to reflect on what they've read about in mine and maybe integrate them as they iterate back through their model. But it's all about them. It's not about me. Amy uh, Amy's the one who guided me in that direction, actually. Amy? Uh, you know? Well, Doug, you explained it perfectly, but it's it really is we worry about being too prescriptive, even though Doug... We want to have a, a clear point of view because Doug's leadership expertise and his story and his experience is special and unique, and he has a lot of wisdom to share. But if we started with this manifesto, um, and don't get scared by the word manifesto, it's 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 not a deranged you know screed. It is very thoughtful. Um, but he, if if people read that first, then their leadership foundation would look too much like Doug's, and we find this even in our, our blueprint. Boot Camp, which is a training program anchored in the insights of the blueprint. Uh, we have people do pre-work before they come to the program because if they get overexposed to Doug's leadership model, the Conant Leadership Flywheel, we're going to have a bunch of people who just are making flywheels. So we don't want to exert so much prescriptive influence over somebody's unique leadership model before they have a chance to go through the process. So that's kind of why it's structured that way. 
Well, I found it in, incredibly useful to, to walk through the, the six steps, but it is difficult in that you are, there's no teacher, there's no one sort of, I mean, you can talk to other people, but you're asked to think your own thoughts and your own foundation, your own principles, what you believe in, all of which you should have, you should have a foundation like that. But since it is self-help and since there are a lot of other things going on in one's life, what advice do you have for someone who's stuck on level three, which I think is called study, and they look up and they see there's, you know, six more steps or there's three more steps of, and then and, and the top one is, is called improve. And they've been doing that all along. How do you get them sort of, pardon the expression, unstuck and, well, and, and, uh, and make sure they finish their way through through the, the whole blueprint? Amy, the, the key idea here is forget perfection. Whatever you do when you go through this process the first time is wrong. It's not going to be fully formed. And so we, we, the, your first step is envision the future you want. And what are your goals to be as a leader? And whatever you pick will be wrong. That's okay. Then you reflect on your life and, and feather that into your thinking. Then you study the world around you. People that you respect and you can learn from doesn't have to be everybody. It'll, it, it will be incomplete. And then you build your own model based on that thinking. You identify some practices for it. And then you start to work on a, a continuous improvement loop. So after you go through it once, you say, oh, how did that go? And you go back and say, would I change my goals a little bit here? Am I missing something in reflection now that I'm sort of into this? Is there somebody else I want to study or learn from? How would I tweak my plan? And so the key to all of this is forget perfection, give it the time you have to give it, and just stay with it. And uh, it, what we find is after people have iterated through it a time or two, it's, it's second nature. You know, how can I, you know, is, are my goals right? Is there anything I, I, I could have learned from my past that I haven't really dealt with yet? Is there anybody I could learn from? How would I change my leadership thinking a little bit? What would I tweak here? And play with it and enjoy it and say, because ultimately this is a reflection of you and how you want to walk in the world and, uh, and, and just try and just enjoy the ride. Uh, what people tell us, I just received an email today from uh, uh, Melissa, Amy, I think I forwarded it to you. She's uh, head of training and development for NetJets. And uh, she was saying how helpful it is. She just went through the process and, uh, and it's, she feels more effective and more fulfilled every day because she's being more like the leader she wants to be, knowing that it's not perfect, but she'll do a little better tomorrow than she did today. And, uh, and that kind of forget perfection, just do the best you can approach is really the only way to go through this in a cockamamie life. You can't go get a Harvard MBA and, and, and put your life on hold and spend a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, you have to feather this into your life as it is now. In fact, in the book, we talk about how important it is that this process has to nest perfectly in your life as it is. If it doesn't nest perfectly, you won't sustain it. So we have you building it in a way that fits. And if not, we all know about the habits we have uh, uh, when we go on a diet on January 1st after the holidays and we say, okay, now I'm gonna lose 10 pounds and I'm gonna give up this and I'm gonna give up that. And then all of a sudden you can't sustain it because it doesn't fit into your cockamamie life. And uh, we don't wanna have that. We wanna build something that's practical that you can use time and again. That's what Stephen Covey did with the seven habits in many ways. And that's what we tried to do here. Amy, you wanna add anything or? I uh, covered it all, but it's uh, the the process of iteration uh, is so important that step six is improve. It's one of the steps in the process is to just keep iterating in a way that works for you. And so each step is bite sized. You don't have to approach the process saying I'm going to get through all of this all at once. If you can, if you can just start with step one and vision, you're one step closer. Uh, to becoming the leader, the fullest expression of the leader that you want to be and were meant to be. So it's bite-sized by design. Yeah. Well, we talk about that in forget perfection, embrace iteration. That's the idea. Forget perfection, embrace iteration. 
I, yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I had heard an expression that was along the lines of uh, progressive and progressive improvement beats postponed perfection, um, which is a similar thing. Now you explain in the book that uh, about that, that, that a leadership purpose, sort of a unifying why can help uh, empower leaders to sort of uh, not just live for the resume, but live for their eulogy. <laughs> um, and so explain a little bit uh, for the folks why a purpose is so important and how the blueprint can help a person as kind of find their own purpose. Yeah, uh, this was all triggered by a wonderful book. Uh, well, a wonderful uh, TED talk that David Brooks gave the New York Times columnist. Uh, and uh, why, you know, are you living for your resume or your eulogy? And in that TED talk, he talks about the learnings he had from Joseph, uh, 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 Jewish rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik. And this is all based on his work and want to give him credit, but David Brooks brought it to life for me. And he comments that, you know, we get sucked into living our, for our resume. Do, did I get a parking spot closer to the, to the elevator? Uh, did, I get, did I get my bonus? Am I keeping up with this person and that person? And uh, when, when am I gonna get promoted relative to someone else? And we get trapped in that kind of game. And then he, he observes that at the end of our life, when we talk about what, what do you want your eulogy to look like, it bears no resemblance to the life you've chosen to lead. And uh, so that was his observation. And the, our perspective is, you have to embrace both. It's not one or the other. Am I living for my resume or my eulogy? I'm going to live uh, for my eulogy, but I'm going to be building a resume that's connected to it. And uh, a purpose does that. A purpose says, I, in my case, I want to help build high performance or high trust, high performance teams that honor people, defy the critics and thrive in the face of adversity. That's what I love to do. That's what I want to do. It has an element of performance and resume building in embedded in it. It also has what I want to be known for as someone who honors people and who tries to bring the eye of the tiger to everything he encounters. And, uh, and that one phrase has tied all that together for me. And as I've gone through my career, I've found that if I stay focused on my leadership purpose, which is what you do in step one of our book, it helps me keep my eulogy in mind and build my life in a way that's, that's connected to it. Uh, and Amy, Amy, is, uh, Amy, you should comment on this. I thought you contributed mightily to the articulation of this uh, in the book. Uh, thanks, Doug. You've explained it very well, um, but something that's in, important to understand is once you understand that, I, I think a lot of leaders can get to the point where they understand that this purpose is so important, and the way we frame it in the book, it is this unifying why that connects your eulogy virtues and your resume virtues and helps you align those. So but a lot of leaders then feel overwhelmed. Okay, I need a purpose. How do I figure that out? You can't just kind of wait to be struck by some epiphany from above. So what we designed in the blueprint is a proactive way to uncover what that purpose is. There are literally prompts for reflection. We ask you the questions that you might not think to ask yourself because it's, it's hard. It's a heavy lift. How do I discover my purpose? Um, and that's why we really wanted to be that helping hand go through these questions for reflection and you'll at least come out of the blueprint with a rough draft of your purpose. Even if you change it, even if you have to scrap it five times, it, it really gives you a process to be proactive about uncovering your purpose rather than waiting for, you know, heavenly epiphany to strike you, which I think is helpful for a lot of leaders. This is, you, know, you started this book in 2018 and in that sense you were ahead of your time on this front and that is you use an expression in the book called uh, something along the lines of make meaning, not money. Um, and now companies are starting to realize that maybe they should be about making meaning, not money. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what that means to the individual leader, the business of making meaning, not money. Well, uh, I'm also a chair of the, the Center for High Ambition Leadership in Boston. And 
And there we talk about our, our belief. It comes from a book uh, written by uh, Harvard uh, Professor Emeritus Mike Beer, and it was called Higher Ambition, How Great Leaders Create Economic and Social Value. And uh, a terrific book. And uh, we started this nonprofit built around that concept. And now we talk about purposeful leaders uh, building higher performing organizations and a better world. And uh, I've got to tell you, I see this going on everywhere. And I have been seeing it for the last decade. I see companies leaning into the concept of total, what I would call going from total share owner returns, if we talk business to total stakeholder returns. And they're looking at their role in society as well as their role within their, their sphere of influence with stakeholders. And uh, I think leaders have to do that as well. I, I honestly believe that great leaders can create and will create economic and social value. Uh, they just have to frame it that way to begin with and realize that uh, whether you're running electrical engineering services or a food company, you are serving people and you are focusing on meeting the needs of all of your stakeholders in a, in a compelling way. It's not just about shareholders. And uh, so I see leaders today looking for that purpose connected to their resume building and hungering to make a difference. Look, when I was uh, CEO of Campbell, we published two things on our portal uh, for all of our employees. We published our annual report and our corporate social responsibility report. Uh, which one do you think was opened? <laughs> Not the annual report. Ladder. None of the employees could, the employees could have cared less. But the corporate social responsibility report was opened by everyone. We subsequently learned it was shared with everyone. Parents would share it with their children. Look at what, our, look at what, mom or dad's company is doing to help fifth generation family farms or to preserve water or lower our footprint. And, uh, and that was what was meaningful to our employees. We found there was this beautiful relationship that began with, we focused on taking care of our, our workplace. We did better in the marketplace and then we tried to help build a better world. And the more we leaned into that idea, people got in, more engaged in the workplace and we did better in the marketplace. I mean, this can be a cycle of success that has great endurance. So uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is, I'm happy to say, I believe will be a cost of doing business going forward. And uh, every enterprise that has any desire to be enduring is going to have to have a sense of purpose that transcends the ordinary. You have no choice. Yes, and it's a sense of purpose that everybody can, the, the whole team can buy into. That the stake, all stakeholders can buy into, right. your customers, your suppliers, and society. So I, thank you. I'm going to ask one more question of Amy and Doug, and then, uh, and then I'll take the questions that have been submitted. And so this, if you've been holding off doing that, if you'd like to put a, a question into the box, the Q&A box is down at the bottom of your screen. Just click on that and... and uh, and, and fire away and we'll ask as many as we can. Now, one question I did want to ask is your book is filled with a lot of great advice. And in truth, it comes close in some ways to being common sense, but it's always amazed me how common sense is not in common usage. But it's a little <laughs> like your, your comment about the habits, you know, the, and, and, the, and the going on a diet. Someone has realized they need to get unstuck and they, they start going through the process and maybe they make it to, 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 to step six. And, and, and can iterate a bit, but in the crush of business, in the, in the, in the, in the hurly burly world we all live in, especially the one we live in now, it's easy to get off track and to forget the common sense things you should be doing, the common sense things the book taught you. How do you, what does the book do to help people, unlike the dieter, kind of stick to the plan and to keep the rudder in the water and, and to keep moving forward in, in what, in, in, with their purpose? Well, uh, the first piece is we make it very approachable. Uh, and we, we say, forget perfection, do the best you can with what you have, where you are, and let's just iterate together. And uh, we find that is, that unleashes, that creates freedom for the person to engage in a way that works for them. 
and we acknowledge that this has to nest perfectly in your cockamamie life. So let's build it that way from the outset. The other thing we do uh, is we have a very active ongoing dialogue with everyone that participates in Conan Leadership. I mean, there we, you can connect to us through our website or every day on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, or Instagram. So there is a constant dialogue going on here. I guess a, a third thing is we encourage you as you get up and running with this to share it, going back to something Amy talked about, to create a sense of accountability with someone else. And we encourage you that first week you go back, the second thing we suggest is that you share this emerging thinking with a, colleague, with a trusted colleague, one trusted colleague. And I'm telling you, that's a big step because you talk to somebody you trust who knows your company, knows your situation, knows your organization, if it's a nonprofit, uh, and you share, you know, I just went through this, I'm trying to figure this out. Uh, what do you think? Does this reflect the person, me? Is this kind of, does this seem to make sense? And once you start sharing it with someone else, you declare yourself, which we also talk about in the book, it makes it much easier to go through this. Uh, you're not alone. You don't need to be alone in this pace. Uh, you just need to find people you trust to share it with, and it gets much easier. Uh, what, what would you say, Amy? Agree, and, and building on that, it is hard to keep your, your rudder in the water with a change process. So understanding that the idea behind building the foundation is helping you to articulate, setting aside the time as part of it to help you articulate what matters to you as a leader, how you want to show up, what you expect from others, what you expect from yourself. Leaders are so busy. It's my doorbell. Leaders are so busy uh, reacting to everything that comes at them in a day, even just setting aside the time to think through these things is can be a radical act uh, and an enormous step forward. Because once you've gone through it once, you have that language forever. Even if you don't keep working the territory, you at least know now I am some, I'm a leader who values courage over everything. I'm an independent thinker. I'm whatever words you found in the process, you have that language with you forever, whether or not you continue to work the territory or not. And that alone has immense power for leaders. John, I'm gonna pile on before you go uh, to, the, to the audience. Uh, you know, as leaders, we have plans for everything. Any leader I talk to has a plan. Here's my strategic plan. Here's my uh, monthly plan. Here's my operations plan. Here's my procurement plan. We have plans for everything. I ask a leader, well, what's your plan for your leadership? And it's, well, quite frankly, I'm doing it by the seat of my pants. And, and I'm telling you, Leaders, we're affecting people's lives. I treat this responsibility as sacred ground. And we got to do better than by the seat of our pants because we're busy. That's just not good enough. You owe people more than that. And so you, you have to set aside the time. We set aside the time for everything else. This is the most important thing. You know, as a CEO, and you learn this, I learned this the hard way. I found out I really don't do anything. Everybody that works for us does all the work. I have to lead them in an impactful way. It's a big job. I ought to think about it. I shouldn't do it by the seat of my pants. I don't care if you're working with two or 200 or 200,000. So the, you, you have to become intentional. You have to find some time, but we know it's not easy. So we give you ways to do it. But look, if you want to be a leader, you got to step up. And you've got to engage and you got to own it and you got to be accountable for it. You're affecting people's lives. I'm off my soapbox. Bring on the questions. Uh, I'll, I'll just pile on, I'll pile on your thing. One thing I did find interesting or and useful was you, you give sort of a baby steps approach to how to take it to the workplace and build on it. And I think that that was very helpful. And I think that's something that people can start with and prove to themselves. This diet works. I can live on this. Here's a question that's interesting, and I'm going to embellish it a bit for those who haven't read the book. And it, it deals with the fact that near the end of the book, as I recall it, there is a, a near fatal, you're in a near fatal car accident, and Doug was not the driver, um, that took place back when you were CEO of Campbell's Soup Company. You said, 
is the question. Your experience in the hospital affirmed several leadership lessons. Several leadership lessons were affirmed by you being in the hospital. Can you talk about that and explain what you meant? Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a near fatal car accident. Not that I remember it exactly. It was July 2nd. 2009 at two in the afternoon on the New Jersey Turnpike, exit six. Uh, my uh, driver, I think, dozed off. I was sleeping in the back seat of the car uh, with my seatbelt on, thank God. And we ran into the back of a stopped truck and we were going 70 or 80 miles an hour. Uh, I was asleep, so I don't know exactly how fast, but it was fast. I had a crushed torso and, and uh, it was a challenging challenging time. I spent a lot of time in the hospital. And, uh, uh, you know, and I'm going to say this, metaphorically, everybody I work with has been through a car accident that day. Something has gone wrong. They've run into a roadblock. Everybody you work with has metaphorically in this pandemic laced world, they've had a car accident that day, maybe a small fender bender, but it's still been an accident. And so uh, my lessons as I was trying to recover from that, dealing with doctors and nurses, uh, was they were, they were powerful lessons. I learned that, uh, and this was a foundation for our first book, Touch Points, about powerful leadership connections in the smallest of moments. When you're in a hospital and a nurse is coming in, if they're coming in with, uh, with a how can I help mentality and I'm really here for you, uh, you get that and they can have great impact on your recovery. Then there's a nurse coming in who's running late and who's got to get to the next room in no time. And you're just a check on the list. You know how to read that. And you know how you feel as you feel as if you've interrupted her schedule and it, and, and, and you have doctors that kind of come and go the same way. And I learned how important it was with everybody I interacted with when I got out of that hospital to really pay attention and to pay attention to those small moments and say, how can I help him? What's going on? And mean it. And I, I realized how in the, hum, in the rush of everyday life, we pay lip service to it, but we don't pay attention. So uh, that was probably the single, singest, biggest, the single biggest lesson I learned in the hospital was pay attention. Uh, and if you're not paying attention, if you're a busy executive and you're buzzing through offices, you're going to become known as somebody who's not paying attention. And they're going to, and people are going to question how much you care. They're going to question of how question how invested you are in, in what you're doing for the enterprise and for them. And uh, so the big lesson for me was pay attention. Here's an interesting, thank you. This is an interesting question um, for both of you. You put a lot of emphasis in the book uh, about uh, the value uh, of uh, handwritten thank you notes, which are obviously a great touch. What changes, if any, to that method uh, have you made as faster methods of communications, maybe even more familiar methods to some people um, uh, of communication have come along like email and texts and, and, and that sort of thing? How, how do you uh, feel about handwritten notes today versus, uh, you know, some of those ways of getting the, the answer well, or the information back to somebody more quickly in a form they, they maybe are more used to. Well, I, I, I love handwritten notes and I'm going to do this really very quickly, but I wrote 10 to 20 notes a day to uh, people uh, at Campbell Soup for a decade, six days a week. Um, and I, I had everything I printed out for me every day. I'm old, so it wasn't available online as much, but it was printed out from the portal. I read it on my way home and I wrote notes on the way to work every day. Uh, and 10 to 20 a day, short notes. And I, I and John, you know this, uh, companies in particular are great critical thinking machines. We're built to fix what's wrong. And uh, what I found was even in the most broken companies, eight out of 10 things were being done right, but nobody was talking about it. And I was committed to bringing some balance to this because we were going to find out what was wrong and we were going to fix it. But I was damned if I wasn't going to celebrate what was right. So I started sending these notes out. When I retired 10 years later, I was being interviewed by, I think, Fortune magazine. And they said, how many of no these notes have you written? 
I said a lot. And we said 10 to 20 a day. It turned out I'd written 30,000 notes. Yeah. Campbell only had 20,000 employees. And, uh, and wherever you went in the world, we were in 38 countries. And wherever you went in the world in a cubicle, you would see a handwritten note from me directly to that person about a contribution they had made to our company with, and, and with my appreciation. And oftentimes I would send those notes, Federal Express to Australia, to the individual's home because they had done something special and I wanted them to open it with their family. I wanted them to know that I was paying attention going back to that other discussion we had and that I was, and that I cared about what was going right as well as all the things we had to fix. I still approach it that way. It's just, I don't do as many handwritten notes but I think timely notes are important. I think it's important to make them personal. And, uh, and I mentioned a note I received today from uh, Melissa at NetJets. She's already got a note back from me <laughs> ex expressing my appreciation in, in a meaningful way. And so I think it's important to make them timely. I think it's important to make them personal. Look, uh, you want people to take their work personally when they work with you. If you want them to take their work personally, you have to take their work personally. There's no other way around it. Thank you. I, I, have, I have two questions I wanna be sure we get in. One of them comes from a person who I know is an unbelievably good writer. And she says, "Would you, Doug, would you please address how to overcome special challenges that individuals may face? One challenge is the pandemic, but also in the best of times, some have historically had a tougher time advancing specifically women and minorities. And so this goes back to a comment you started with a little while back, but what advice would you give to them? Well, I think uh, work the blueprint. <laughs> I think that you're facing challenging situations. I mean, more challenging than other people are facing. You need to have even more, you need to have the courage of your convictions. To do that, you need to know your convictions and you got to be incredibly well anchored in them. That advice comes directly from my Angelou, who knows what I'm talking, knows what this person is talking about. So do the work, get really well grounded in what you believe in and how you want to walk in the world. That's the first thing. And if, if there was something else, I would say focus on your strengths, not on the things that are getting in the way. Build on your strengths. I, I find that people who succeed in whatever career they choose, very rarely is it about fixing your weaknesses. Virtually always, it's about leveraging your strengths. So as you go through the blueprint, think about what your strengths are, what really works for you, and then find ways to leverage your strengths. Uh, you know, I'm still working on the same weaknesses, John, I was working on 50 years ago. Uh, but I, to, quite honestly, I found ways to leverage the things that I can do well. And that's my advice to anybody who is dealing with a challenging situation. Get well grounded in the courage of your convictions, leverage your strengths. And in my experience, you can find a win-win in almost any organization doing that and then finding a way to honor the expectations of the organization. So that's... Good oh, advice. Amy, you want to add anything to what Doug has uh, covered? I would say that's all great advice. And also um, for leaders who are listening, it's, it's helpful for leaders who are members of privileged groups to exert their influence to be champions for those who are less privileged. Uh, I know Doug has spoken about how, you know, gender equality, for, this is true of racial justice, this is true of gender equality, but, you know, gender equality isn't a woman's issue, it's also a men's issue. Uh, I think Doug actually has it's quoted in a piece in Newsweek today where he's talking about how important this is for male leaders to be champions for women uh, as well. Um, yeah, that's good, good stuff. That's what I would add. We have time. For one one quick uh, add-on question to the one about the handwritten notes, uh, and we have just a minute to go. So uh, the question is: Great comments about handwritten notes. Uh, what what have been some of the quantifiable and less tangible returns on that practice? Well, we went from the worst uh, employee engagement in the Fortune 500 uh, over the decade to the absolute best wow. in the Fortune 500, uh, as measured by Gallup 
every year for 10 years, we went from an engagement ratio of 1.6 to one, which is 1.6 people in, invested in the work and one person who's looking for a job to 23 to one, which was the best in the Fortune 500 over the decade. And I, we did a lot of things, but a big part of it was making it personal, celebrating our successes while we were also dealing with all the tough stuff. And so, uh, and uh, there's a whole, book, there are books written by uh, the Gallup organization on you know, the power of employee engagement and how it actually enhances financial returns. Uh, it's, it's undeniable at this point, the research is so strong. Great stuff. I just want to end with two comments that have arrived that are not in the form of questions. The first is the, from the person who asked the question about how do women and minorities, how can you help them progress? The answer is bravo on the answer and kudos to Doug who chose a woman successor at Campbell and selected a female co-writer. And this, this woman who wrote that is very accomplished in her own right. And then you got a comment from a former colleague, Lisa Gaines McDonald, who says, Doug, thanks, Doug, love the advice of just starting and perfecting it. Uh, claims to be an old colleague. I doubt she's old, but <laughs> a colleague from General Mills. Oh. On behalf of everybody who has attended, and I will tell you that uh, we did get a question from someone in Saudi Arabia as this uh, pr progressed, asking if this session will be is being recorded, which it is, and if it will be available, which it will be. It will be on the uh, American Writer Museum uh, a YouTube channel, as uh, Kerry mentioned at the beginning, we a channel to which you can subscribe, and there's lots of great stuff there. So definitely go there and check it out. Um, you'll find a lot of good stuff, including this program, which it takes about a couple of days to find its way there. And with that, let me thank Doug and Amy so much for taking the time so much for writing the book. My only reaction to the book that I told Doug before, my, the thought that I had as I was reading through it kept recurring is where was this when I was starting out? It's a great book to uh, get started with and it's a great book to pick up if you're in mid-career or late career, if you're, as long as you're into continuous improvement. So thanks for the book. Thanks for this session. Great, uh, great conversation. Very much appreciated. Absolutely like to thank everybody who has tuned in. We appreciate your, your uh, participation in this in this session. We hope you got a lot out of it. We hope you enjoy the Writers Museum programs. And certainly, if you'd like to be sure you don't miss any of these uh, great programs, uh, please become a member. And uh, we'll be sure you get posted on all the programs uh, that, that happen uh, in, in the future. Thanks again to everybody. Um, and everybody, be safe. And thanks a lot for being part of this session. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.